you know, that leads me to now your win, you know, winning the thing, you know, I want to know what you, what was going through your head because you watched the video, you can see you're shocked. Um, and I do want to comment, I did write this down that, um, you already mentioned this, but let me just emphasize that she was the first Miss Nebraska to ever claim Miss America, which is already big enough, but she was the youngest in 74 years at 17. She was the youngest you could be. She made the age cut off by a week. Um, with all those factors in mind, what was going through your head when you won? What did that feel like? Yeah, so um, I had not even expected to make the top five. So Nebraska had never um, done placed, first of all, Nebraska never placed. The best that we had done was top 10 the year prior to me, actually. So uh, Brittany Jeffers, who was Miss Nebraska before me, was amazing, made the top 10 and it was record breaking for Miss Nebraska, right? So when I competed, I thought I've got big shoes to fill and I'm hoping to make the top 10 so that it's not a matter of, oh, we picked the wrong person, you know, that kind of thing. And so I wanted to do my best, make the top 10, I'd be perfectly happy. So once I made the top 10, I was, I was good. I was like, kick me out anytime. I've done it. I'm good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Kick back, enjoy. I'm going to sit here and watch the rest of the pageant now, you know, but uh, it didn't happen. I made the top five and you just don't realize it because it's moving so fast. But um, once I realized I made the top five, I'm standing there backstage with the other top five. And we just looked at each other and said, it's one of us. Like, it's now one of us. Five five. Girls now. It's great. great. And so, um, you know, we, we held hands and prayed backstage. And we're, you know, just whoever it's going to be, it's going to be um, what's meant to happen is, is going to be the outcome. So we go out there and I thought for sure, they're going to call fourth runner up. It's going to be me. Like, for sure, <laughs> you know, no, they call fourth runner up, it wasn't me. Okay, they're gonna call third runner up, it's gonna be me. And, and I'm thinking this is gonna be great because Nebraska is gonna have this huge homecoming celebration for me. I'm the first ever to be third runner up to Miss America, no. Okay, second runner up, this is gonna be amazing. Nebraska's gonna have this great party for me. No, I'm holding the hands of my first runner up, right, Elise, and I'm looking at her and I'm like, oh, she's for sure Miss America. She's incredible, she's amazing, she's beautiful. She was an amazing ventriloquist, crowd favorite, absolutely impressive woman. I think she was about 23 or 24 at the time. So I thought, okay, the judges are giving me first runner up is like a, yeah, you did an amazing job. Good for you. You can be first runner up, but there's no way we're going to trust you with being Miss America and actually doing the job. So when they called my name, I, I honestly did just blank. I don't think there was a single thought going through my mind because it was such a shock. Like I did not even know what was happening because I had not prepared myself for that. Hi everybody. Welcome back. Today's a different day, but the same amazing guests. Don't worry. I know you got scared for a second. Me too. Um, but I'm here again with Teresa Scanlon. And let me just say, she is so nice because, of course, she's super busy. And I was just talking her ear off, so I ran a little bit over. But she was nice enough to agree to spend her Sunday morning with me so I can ask her even more questions and fangirl even more. So thanks again, Teresa, for being here. No, of course. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. She is like such a mom. Like, I love it. She's like, oh, okay, I'm just, hold on one second. I'm getting my son settled in with Paw Patrol. I was like, goddess amazing. We love Paw Patrol. Um, but what we love even more is asking Teresa even more questions. So last time we were talking on Friday, you left off at the part where you said um, it was five girls and we were all saying when we got to the top five of Miss America, it's one of us. And that's where you left right. off. Right. Absolutely. Oh, and also I was thinking actually when we left off, the other piece um, that's kind of funny that when we were backstage, we were ready to go on to announce the, the winner from the top five. The, I can't even remember who was walking behind me, but by accident, she stepped on my dress and ripped the chiffon like all the way up. So I had this big giant rip in the back of my, my dress because it's that white chiffon, right? But it was great because it's like competition's over. You don't have to worry about competing in evening gown anymore. <laughs> so fine. But yeah, that happened like at the last Were minute. you upset? I mean, it would have been oh, so, I would have. No, no, no. It's like you're done with the dress. You already competed in evening gown. <laughs> Teresa is much nicer than me. I would have been throwing hands no I'm just kidding we don't do that but some American girls are nicer than that it was, it was seriously like and again like we talked about before at that point there's just so much that has gone on over yeah the, 
the hours that you've been competing that everything crazy that happens you're like oh well just go with it <laughs> so I didn't know. does it go by fast like when you're at Miss America it just goes by super yeah. fast not not only does the you know the 10 days go by fast but then certainly the competition itself so um, that was like we were talking about. So basically it was where you don't have time to think and really realize, oh, I made the top 15. Oh, I made the top 10. Oh, I made the top five until we had finally like that moment to breathe during a commercial break where we're backstage. And that was when the five of us actually for the first time realized we're the top five, which means it's one of us. <laughs> and so um, walking out there, I, I, again, I definitely didn't think that I was going to be the winner. Um, you know, I think we talked about as the runners up were being called, I thought each yes. time that it was going to be, you know, that it was for sure going to be me. And regardless, it was going to be amazing. You know, it was going to be a record for Nebraska, no matter what I did at that point, it was a record for Nebraska. So that was, that was a cool mindset to be in, I think, too, where I was so happy with the results, no matter what happened. Right. Um, but I was not expecting to win and I don't know there might have been a few people my my interview coach at the time Don Baker was the first person to like tell me that I could be Miss America um, and Don has since passed but he was an amazing amazing man worked with a lot of contestants and um, that was the first time someone had told me you know you can do this before that it was um, no one I didn't think no one thought um, so even in the audience, you know, my parents wouldn't have said like, oh yeah, she could win. They, they would probably tell you, oh, she's great. Like she's awesome, but there's no way she's going to win. <laughs> so, so really, that's, that's cool. <laughs> really, I mean, we were like, oh, this is great. This is fun. But there's just winning was so far out of the question that when they called my name, it was a total shock. Um, I don't really remember anything that I was thinking, um, you know, walking down after winning and it took a while after that too for everything to even sink in at all and to kind of accept that this had happened and I think to a certain extent to this day every day and I think a lot of Miss Americas will tell you this it is sometimes those moments will hit you where you look back and you go wait did that really happen <laughs> am I really Miss America did I win um am I is this really part of my life? So I think there's elements of that, no matter what, that always happen at different points. Just, it's so interesting to me that you were saying, oh my gosh, you know, okay, third runner up, this is great. Second runner up, even better. And then you're like, wait, we're the last two. But right. you thought it was the other girls for sure. I guess that's where exactly where we left off. I apologize. You were saying oh, your um, first runner up, who you thought would win. She's amazing. She's going to be a great Miss America. And then it was you. And then you were like blank. And that. <laughs> You just literally just did not expect it. I think that's just no. absolutely And I mean, you win great scholarship money. Certainly you win the most if you, if you win, obviously. But, you know, every runner-up gets a great scholarship. So I'm just thinking, oh, cool. The higher that I get, the more scholarship money I get. So that's cool, too. But that was more, I think, what I was focused on at that point. Right. And we've touched so much on your age and how young you were, and I don't want to sound redundant, but I do want to know when you won, you weren't expecting to win because of your age. You were a great competitor, but it's just so rare. It usually goes to a girl well out of college, probably in grad school, sometimes even out of grad school. So it's really rare that you get someone who graduated from high school a year early winning Miss America. So that was unexpected. But did it phase you a little bit that you had this giant task at 17 where you thought, I can't do this? Like, I don't have the life experience for this? You know... The funny thing is, I don't think I ever thought that. As much as, as much as I did think that about winning the pageant, I did not have those thoughts about doing the job. I really felt that the job itself was sort of what I was always preparing for my whole life without knowing it. I felt that it was right up my, right up my alley, right in my area of interests, right in my area of, of talents and skill. Um, and so I, I definitely don't remember having that type of idea of it. I was, I knew that there was plenty I didn't know for sure. So right. one thing I did is I tried to, you know, reach out immediately to former Miss Americas and get some advice. Oh. And that. that was super helpful. What another thing I did was, um, I emailed, you know, all of our contestants that year, the women I had competed with, um, to say like, if you have 
feedback, ideas, whatever, what I could do better, those types of things, let me know. Because again, these women were older than me, more experienced, that sort of thing. And so they were all amazing about just being so supportive and encouraging me in the job that I was doing. But I wanted to know, you know, from people um, where I could improve, what I could learn, what I could do, because I was very, very aware that, of course, there was a lot I didn't know, a lot of things that I would mess up on, but it wasn't this idea of particularly because I'm younger that I can't do this job or something. I did, I did feel very passionate about what I wanted to do that year, got to do a lot of great work with my platform on eating disorders, got to work with so many incredible organizations and did feel that I was adding value to people um, in a way that I was really proud of. The 90th anniversary Miss America, your Miss America 2011 is Miss Nebraska, Teresa Scanlon. Nebraska, Teresa Scanlon. The stage is yours. Miss America. Your idea. I like how you've kept this consistent theme that you always had, you know, self-confidence. You you knew you know, what you wanted to do, you knew you didn't want to be anything other than yourself. And even if you faced a lot of challenges, which I will touch on in my next question, because Miss America is a big job and it's a challenging job, but you, you always knew, you never really doubted yourself. You never doubted how much this meant to you, even though you were young, you understood the significance and the weight it held. And I, I think, you know, I can relate a lot because I'm talking to a former Miss America right now. It's my dream just to win a state, let alone Miss America, but gaining the wisdom that I have from all of you guys, it really has taken me such a long way when I started this in May, you know, to now, you know, all the lessons I've learned, it's pretty crazy. So I can attest to the fact that learning from like other c competitors or other former title holders is like life changing, literally. Right, right. Yeah, there's so much that you can gain from other people that it doesn't necessarily have to be firsthand knowledge all the time. And that was, that was something that was really helpful to me as I prepared was learning from other title holders. Um, Miss Nebraska's, Miss America's, Erica Dunlap was, uh, Miss America 2004 was my uh, judge at Miss Nebraska, so oh, she was also a great supporter throughout, and you know, one of the first ones to believe that I could do it, so she's a great friend to say, and just, yeah, talking to, learning from, watching former Miss Americas and uh, former state title holders, it helps so much and you can just learn an immense amount in a short period of time Absolutely. by being open to it you know if you're willing to learn and willing to grow which I was because again I knew that there was so much I didn't know which was I think the benefit of being younger so it was kind of in this mindset of oh my goodness I need to soak in as much information as I can as much knowledge from other people and so that helped I think with being more receptive to learning from other people Absolutely. And shout out to Erica Dunlap, um, the first Black Miss Florida, Miss America 2004, and she's going to be a mom. She's amazing. Yes. Um, so two history-making Miss Americas right here. But now my next question um, touches a little bit on your year and what you said and the challenges you faced. Um, but I did, right, I just want to say what an amazing Miss America you are. You dealt with so much and you did it so gracefully, representing your country and the organization so well. So I do want to say that because really like phenomenal and in an article written by your current law school UC Berkeley you spoke about how hard the job in Miss America really is and you were quoted as saying you have no home base you have no place to live it's just you and two suitcases and your appearance manager everything is 100% controlled what you wear what you do every moment of every day we touched on that and constant appearances constant speeches um, and I think a lot of people overlook that part of it and, you know, don't realize that it's more than just wearing a crown and looking beautiful. It's a lot of hard work. You're traveling every day out of a hotel. You don't really see your family, I'm guessing. And then the second part is, but that wasn't even the hardest part of it all to you. 
because you mentioned before, you didn't really care about being controlled. You didn't care about making appearances, but you were doing all that while battling the online criticism that you received. Mm -hmm. And you wrote, and it was when, or the article said, however, it was when she saw the comments about her online that made her question everything she knew about herself. Each time Teresa would see comments about her online, she felt a piece of herself chip away. It wasn't the comments criticizing her looks or body that got to her. It was when people attacked her intelligence. She knew she was smart, curious, and hardworking, but suddenly no one else did. And as a national you know, figure, as a public figure, you're bound to ridicule. But that's really tough, facing that onslaught all of a sudden, especially when you're not, you know, it, this kind of all happened very quickly, as you said. You weren't really prepared. I don't really, really think anyone ever is. Yeah, that's the thing is that for any any title holder, the jump from being a state title holder to Miss America, yeah, unless you've you know had some amount of you know your five minutes of fame before, there's just nothing like that. There's this overnight success where all of a sudden you go from no one really knowing your name to all of this you know national uh, attention and dialogue and media. Yeah people online, you know, going from some random person in Nebraska where no one knew who I was, you know, to literally that night, all of a sudden there were, you know, fake Facebook profiles popping up, everybody like using my name, you know what I mean? So there just all of a sudden there's this, this attention on, you know, who you are that really many people haven't experienced before and it would be pretty impossible to experience it in that way um in any other capacity than winning Miss America it's just a very um unique thing I think yeah absolutely and you you I mean I guess it was very overwhelming I don't really even know how to properly explain it you like you said you jump up from like I don't know I don't know if Instagram was really like as popular back then mm -hmm. um but Facebook certainly and right. you probably had a couple thousand followers you know from Nebraska all of a sudden you have a hundred thousand followers or however many Miss America followers there are but there's a lot Right. And suddenly it's not just your state watching you, it's all 50 states and yeah. also people. Yeah, and I think that, yeah, it's, it's, it's overwhelming, um, I think, in a couple ways. And one is, again, you can be very secure in, in who you are, but what I've discovered is that the pieces of yourself that you really place your identity in, that's the hardest when I think people attack those. Yeah. And that's, you know, what I was referencing with the whole, when people like attack my appearance, sure, that, that kind of, that never feels good, right? It's like, oh, they're saying I'm not pretty enough. They're not, they're saying I'm not skinny enough to be Miss America, whatever, that kind of thing, right? Um, and then it goes both ways too, because some people would say, oh, you're too pretty and it makes it unrealistic for other people. You're not pretty enough to be Miss America, you know, so there's, you'll never, you'll never please people, right? And then people will say, you're too fat, you're too skinny, this, that, the other. So those things, I'm not going to say they never got to me, but it wasn't like um, shaking the core of my identity. Right. It was definitely more so the fact that I put, you know, my identity was in, first of all, being a believer. And second of all, my whole life, I had worked toward my academic goals and dreams. And so I did... I didn't think I was the smartest person in the world, but rather it was still just recognize the substance of who I am, acknowledge that my thoughts have value, that type of thing, right? So I specifically remember, I think within the first week of winning, I was in my hotel room and um, saw like that pieces of the pageant were on YouTube and I had not watched myself, right? Like you, you compete, you win, and then you're like, oh, I didn't even get to see what I just did, right? right. So I was, okay, let me watch, let me watch these YouTube videos. And I watched, you know, my, my onstage question and answer, which of course, every time you answer, you go back and you think, oh my goodness, there are a thousand things I could have done better, right? But I started scrolling through hundreds and hundreds of comments that were all about, you know, oh, you should just shut up and look pretty. Another blonde with no substance, you know, an idiot, these types of things, right? That were kind of more shocking than maybe they would be to some people because to me I just never in a million years would have expected that I had worked so hard you know on on school and academics and intelligence and wisdom and when I say something I want it to mean something okay. and for people to devalue that really got to me and so it's just interesting now looking back to see how um yeah the constant criticism not just that year but continually 
in these really um, attacking these core areas of my life began to chip away at my self-confidence and my identity in a way that I've had to learn, you know, how do you do that where you still have a good grasp of who you are, where what other people say doesn't have the ability to shake that, but then you still have the ability to take um, feedback, to take people's comments with a grain of salt, you know, to have an inner circle of people that you can trust when they say something, because I think that's what I struggled with when it came to criticism was, if someone makes a comment, is it true or not? And it's hard to go through that process of, of vetting those comments and saying, well, is that something I need to work on? Or is this just hateful criticism, right? So there's like constructive criticism, there's hateful criticism. And sometimes it's honestly harder than people realize to be taking that in, especially when you're in a role like this, where you really do want to do your best. You want to be able to reach people and connect with people. And you feel like you're not doing your job well if they're making these comments. So it was this constant evaluation of, am I doing my job well? What do I need to change? What do I need to work on? And I probably instead let too much of this in and took too much of it to heart, um, which began to make my job really difficult. And right. my, my idea of myself uh, just completely changed. And, you know, you mentioned something about people criticizing your on-stage question. I will say, though, it's clear to see, it's not even bragging that you're very smart. I mean, clearly academics is something that, that shapes you. That's not, I mean, you're humble, but it's true. But regardless, it's hard, if not impossible, to let that also show in 20 seconds, 30 seconds, which everyone who has competed knows yeah. as well. So, you know, I don't, I, with contestants, I say, no matter how great or how terrible your on-stage question answer is, Sure, that's something we all want to work on, but ultimately, it's 20 seconds, and it's it's really difficult. In front of millions of people, and you know, <laughs> is someone in their armchair, you know, relaxing on a Saturday night, scrolling through YouTube, is going to be like, you know, let me think about this, and you know, let me really like l l drown in this answer. And you're like, no, you're on stage in front of millions of people. My feet hurt from wearing heels. I'm freaking out. I'm sweating. I'm trying to let my false eyelashes not fly off. And it is a nightmare when they start coming off. Don't come at me. And it's way harder. <laughs> it's like, it's true. It's true. And people are like, you know, uh, let me think about this answer. No. And Miss America's, I've seen great Miss America answers, and I've seen not so great Miss America answers, but it's really not a testament to how smart these girls are, because I guarantee you every girl on that stage is smart, they're educated. I mean, Miss America is a pageant about education. We've debunked a lot of myths about Miss America here, and that is one of them, that it is just a beauty pageant. It's reinvented itself as a competition, and for good reason, because the girls that participate are smart. And uh, like you said, an on-stage question is not a fair judgment of that. It's just how quick can you think on your feet? Right. And then throughout, throughout the year, I think one thing that a lot of people don't understand, especially those who don't compete, um, is the job throughout the year. That every single woman who competes, and especially who becomes Miss America, is very passionate about actually making an impact, actually making a difference in a tangible way, right? So they work as hard as possible all year long to try to impact people and add value to people in every way that they can. And so a lot of people don't understand how difficult that job is. And then coupled with this idea that there are thousands of people all year long telling you you're doing a terrible job about something you're so passionate about is really uh, an interesting experience for every Miss America to, to go through. And, you know, now having spoken with so many of my former Miss America sisters about it, it's clear we all go through it. It's just crazy how it's a terrible learning curve for all of us. And it's, it's not to complain about that, you know, because of course everyone deals with criticism, but it really is its own like category. I think it's just a yeah. whole different thing. Yeah, I think it's absolutely like the job of Miss America. I was talking to uh, Miss America 1977, Dorothy Benham, who, you know, it's different without social media, but she did say that, you know, there is criticism no matter what year you are and that it's almost impossible. It's, it's actually not possible to find um, an experience quite like this. That's why you guys are all so close. You all are sisters and, um, you know, you share this very relatable experience where you're like, you know, no one else has gone through this. You're, rep you're literally the queen of the country for a year. <laughs> and 
and I do think that, yeah, as, as you and, and anyone could imagine, social media has changed it quite a bit, too. Oh, yeah. that, you know, everyone knows social media has, has become a more augmented way of everyone letting their opinions, especially negative opinions, be known and to attack people. And um, I am all, again, I'm all about feedback and constructive criticism, but it's just a whole different thing because I think that what what I've seen social media do, and even sometimes media generally, is create this, this uh, you know, barrier between people where the person on this side thinks that isn't even a person. It's just, you know, an idea, a celebrity, someone who I will never reach or talk to. So they think that there's like this barrier in between. And the interesting thing is something I discovered during my year is that that happens even in person with Miss Americas where you will be five feet away from someone and they act like you can't hear them somehow. <laughs> they think that you are in a bubble or there's some type of barrier where you can't hear what they're saying. And so it would happen in parades when you're going past and you're like, I'm 10 feet from you. I can hear everything you're saying. And that's everything from, you know, men making gross comments to, to each other or people again, just saying, mean things, yeah. people say nice things, but even their nice comments, they seem to think that you can't hear them or something. <laughs> so it was, it was just fascinating to me to realize the type of, of, of barriers we put between ourselves as people, especially when someone has a crown on or has a title or is a yeah. or something we suddenly just kind of think they're a thing they don't probably have the same thoughts and feelings as me and let me treat them not like a person, right? So it, it, it really transformed my mindset regarding that in general, everything from politicians to celebrities to public figure, everything. Now I will forever look at our interactions with those individuals and what we say online about people so differently, so completely differently because it just opened my eyes to all of that. It's one of the toughest things to go through because it's not even like you're besides the fact of like they're 10 feet away from you and they're acting like they can't hear you it's not really like they're ever confronting you face to face um it's probably one of the toughest things you have to go through but i will just end that by commending you by saying that you dealt with it beautifully and to me like i'm not just saying this i idolize you so i think that the people that idolize you and think you're amazing surely outweigh the negative people although in a sea of positive comments it's easy to pick that one negative one and be like why would you criticize my shoes, Karen, back off. Um, don't come for Teresa Scanlon's shoes or I'll come for you. I'm not kidding. Don't, don't do that. Um, I literally, Teresa's hype woman and her bodyguard now, be afraid. Even though she's combat trained, I, I'm still here. Don't hey, worry. Got back up. <laughs> got back up. Don't worry, guys. I'm not, do I have combat training? No, but do I have a lot of personality? Yes. Um, and you're right. That's the amazing thing too, specifically about the organization is the supporters and people who are there for you and love you no matter what, and you can mess up and people are still just incredible, just amazing. Yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been so blown away by what an awesome family it is, how incredible my supporters can be, you know, just it really is a family. It's pretty small, and that can be just the best feeling in the world. You know that you belong once you're in this environment, and people are are incredible. They've always been there for me. You know, ten years later, they're still there for me. Absolutely. And um, one of the, the Miss Americas I talked to said, "If you call one of the former Miss Americas and you need her for something, it's almost guaranteed that she'll be there." Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, and that's with a lot. Right. It's, it's really like a lifetime thing, which is incredible. And um, yeah, I, and I will just say one more time that I think you're literally amazing. I was flipping out when you DM'd me and I was like, okay, I'm hyperventilating, but we're going to act casual. So she doesn't <laughs> think I'm scary. You've done a great job acting casual, so you're good. <laughs> I think so. I think I've only like fangirled and went on a rant about like seven times, which is like, you know, a low for me. Uh, <laughs> She's like, great, great job. Really ki killing it, girl. Um, so now that makes me sad because we're on our last question. And that means that, you know, my time as Teresa's Hype Woman is not over. It's just coming to a close for today, but I'll survive somehow. My last question for you is, um, through your work with the Miss America organization, you started out as a candidate, then you um, were Miss America, and now you're a former Miss America, or forever Miss America, rather. 
What was the best part of this journey to you? What was the silver lining of your entire experience? Oh goodness, of the entire thing. Um, I know. It, I think it's sort of a, um, a ripple effect, maybe is the best way to explain it, that it forever changed the course of my entire life because like you said, it really is a lifetime thing um, where so many significant things in my life have indirectly or directly been from been the result of my experience competing. I think many of them would have happened even if I hadn't won Miss America, but just a product of competing generally in the organization. But certainly by winning Miss America, there were uh, obviously, as we talked about, lots of pros, lots of cons, plenty of plenty of uh, good and bad in there. But ultimately, it completely guides and transforms the rest of your life. Like we said, giving you experiences that you've never had in any other way. So looking back, I know for a fact that if I could do it all over again, I would. If I could have competed again, even after my year, I would have. <laughs> you know, like, no. can I keep doing this? <laughs> So that clearly shows that the good outweighs the bad. And, and to this day, so many of the things that I've been able to do and experience and people that I know and that I've met um, have been a product of the organization. And it is one of the most incredible things that I think about now is the, the network of people that I know all over the country and all over the world that are in place because of that experience and making those connections with people is invaluable you know that that matters most in life you um can only get that through you know organically connecting with people always having this idea of valuing people and adding value to them and since that's what the job is all about and that's what miss america is all about i think it enables us to continue to connect with people um, all over in in a way that we can't otherwise Absolutely. And I love that you mentioned making connections with people. That's clearly something that's important to you. And even when you mentioned earlier in our interview, connecting with the troops and how that's influenced your career choice and your path in life, that's very special. And just another way the organization has impacted you. And you've even connected with people that you don't know you've connected with, like me. I mean, unless I had reached out to you, you would have never known that there's a girl in South Florida that's like hashtag obsessed. Um, but and as, as much as I make light of it, I mean, you really have inspired me. And going into this organization, of course, we look at former Miss Americas and what we want to be like. And of course, you are that to me and that's why i'm so grateful that you came on here today it means the world and um i mean now teresa scale and i are best friends so it's not that big of a deal but it was a big deal no it still is a huge deal so. and, and honestly i mean juliet that it's it's people like you though that make me think oh i can look back and say everything was worth it because that's the whole idea right is that it's so it's so cool to see someone like you who is competing, passionate about what you're doing, you know, making a positive impact in the world and being inspired by people who did it before. That is incredible to me because I mean, when I won, you were so young, you know, but the fact that that, that, that can last years is the coolest thing ever to me. And so that's why I'm so glad that you reached out. I'm so thankful that we got to do this and talk and that you had me here because this is so impressive to see you doing this. Um, and also, like you said, to use other people's stories to find what you can learn is so impressive. You'd think that's common and it's not. So I can just say as a contestant doing that and trying to reach out and learn from people, you've already set yourself you know, way above most other contestants, seriously. Thank you so much. It means a lot. And I mean, you guys who are watching this, if you're Patrick contestants, you should be thanking me because I get Teresa Scanlon's wisdom for free. You don't even have to go through the fear and the nervousness of talking to Teresa freaking Scanlon. You're just relaxing. Next, next, Juliet and I are going to do a paid program that you do have to pay to learn. I'm hundred dollars <laughs> per YouTube video, and we're making ten YouTube videos, and you guys are going to have it's VIP access. So we'll see. Um, I love that. Teresa is not only all the amazing things she is, but now she's a businesswoman and she's going to make me lots of coin. So. <laughs> but Teresa, you are amazing. Thank you so much for being here. I want to let you get back to Jason Paw Patrol because that's, well, Paw Patrol is getting intense this season. Um, so I'll let you figure that out. But you're amazing and thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Bye. 
Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning into my channel today. Your support means the world to me. If you like what you saw, please subscribe to my channel and like and comment on my videos because your support is what fuels my ability to make content. I'll see you guys next time. Once again, thanks for joining me for another episode of The Silver Lining. Love you guys. Bye.